everyone warm warm welcome uh, one welcome to everyone to this online event. My name is Etienne Basso and I'm the director of the Members Research Service at EPRS. And a particular welcome to our Vice President, Martin Hoysik, and to the speakers, Mechtil Rose, Lisbeth van Grift, and Jan Henrik Meyer. We are going to discuss today the origins of the social policy, environmental policy, and consumer policy. Policies that gradually developed since the late 60s to become central in the policy making. For each of them, we have now a full fledged policy, legislative powers under co decision or ordinary legislative procedure, and a parliamentary committee responsible in the European Parliament. But this took a long time. Looking back is important. It helps understand how individual members, political groups, and committees pushed for new policy developments. To introduce the event, we have the privilege to have with us today, Vice President Hoysik. The Vice Presidents in the European Parliament are members of the Bureau, and within the Bureau, among his responsibilities, Vice President Hoysik is in charge of parliamentary research and the EPRS. In Slovakia, he is Vice Chair of the Progressive Slovakia Party, and this party is member of the Renew Group in the European Parliament. In the European Parliament, he's member of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, so-called ENVI Committee, and of the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality, as, as well as Vice Chair of the Committee of Inquiry on the Protection of Animals During Transport. He has long-standing experience in matters of environmental protection and climate change, over the past 25 years, he worked in a number of international organizations, including Greenpeace, for Powers International. And these commitments uh, in environmental organizations resonate particularly with uh, the discussion we are going to have today. So we are very much welcoming you, uh, Vice President, and over to you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, and thank you, Etienne Basot, for the welcome and the kind introduction. Now, I'm delighted to introduce to this event organized by the EPRS and for those of you, which I don't think there are many, but EPRS means Directorate General for Parliamentary Research Services. Now, in four months time, minus few days, we will have European elections. And as we are reaching the end of the term, I dare to say this was the most intense term in the history of the European Parliament. Co-decision has been mainstream and is well named ordinary legislative procedure. We indeed play as a house a key role in producing major legislation. We'll have the final figure of the achievements of this term in April, but at this stage, we can say that we have worked on more than 400 different procedures. Now, Parliament collectively and its president personally have also strengthened the parliamentary diplomacy. From day one of the Russian war of aggression, we have strongly encouraged member states to do more to support Ukraine in its struggle for survival, democracy, and our shared European values. At the same time, the ninth legislature has been also challenging for us as a parliament. The COVID crisis massively disrupted our working practices that deepened, uh, depend on close personal contact, communication and cooperation. No more you could just bump into the other members, into the corridors and, and deal with things. Everything had to go online for a while, but we managed that. And it was not the only crisis. The repeated crises that we faced have helped to serve uh, and strengthen uh, executive power. And actually, I think as the parliament made us more resilient. We have been a strong legislative body, but we have actually liked in fulfilling our control function towards the commission and implementation of the EU legislation as per Article 226 of the treaties. I think that's something where we should look and hopefully will look as a house in the next mandate closer while maintaining our strong work on uh, the legislation itself. Now, today's event will explore how new transnational policy issues emerged from the late 60s to the early 80s, and it will focus on the role of the individual MEPs, political groups, the committees, and the European Parliament collectively that they played in European, Europeanizing debate and getting the European community to act. The presentations are based on three studies, research and written for the Parliament by historians and social scientists, which will come out shortly. 
linked EPRS briefings have been already published and provide synopsis of the findings. And you can find the link to, to these briefings in a chat. Now, the first presentation by Matt Charles Ross from the University of Augsburg explores the issues of social policy, which, uh, which arose as a result of the market integration and implementation of freedom of movement in the European community after 58. They reached from housing for migrant workers to support for disabled people, for example, accompanied by cross-border political mobilization. However, member states were probably also reluctant at the time to agree on su substantial spending programs with the strong fiscal redistribution. And this is something which is very interesting to look deeper into as we are now having quite an intense debate about the social pillar of union. And I think this, is, this debate is going to continue into the future and possibly result in some legislation as well and implementation, which we can see already starting a bit. The second presentation, uh, presentation by Elisabeth van der Grieff from the University of Utrecht is based on a study co-authored with Cohen van Zon and explores the issues of consumer protection. They became more salient for the European community when it abolished customs and started working towards the elimination of non-tariff barriers. Scandals created media attention and demand for European community level regulation. And we keep on working on this issue until now. Right now, these days, we have uh, the legislation that it's prohibiting the what I call the greenwashing claims. So consumer protection is ever alive, and it's going to be really interesting to look into where it's coming from on the European level and uh, where are the origins. And a third presentation by Jan Henrik Meyer from the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt focuses on European Parliament's role in Europeanization of environmental policy. And as you heard in my introduction, that's something which is very close to my heart. And honestly, Europe played a crucial role in advancing through its own environmental policy to global change. Now, in the absence of the explicit treaty powers, but faced with obviously cross-border issues like air and water pollution, the European community had to improvise at the beginning to address uh, these issues. It only became explicitly competent for the environment into a single European Act and the Maastricht Treaty. So now it looks like a long time ago, but actually it's important to acknowledge it was not from the start and was something which was reflected the reality on the ground of what needed to be done. Now, at last, such issues were beginning to be addressed in Western Europe during the Cold War. In where I come from, in Central and Eastern Europe, we faced the very same issues. In Slovakia, heavy industry was massively contributing to the pollution. Uh, honestly, it's from place where I live near Bratislava, you could see the cloud of smoke hanging over the uh, chemical factory on the outskirts. And it was really something where we saw dead trees from the acid uh, rain in uh, the hills around Bratislava. So it was a strong issue, but highlighting it and bringing that into public, well, was something which the communist regime didn't like. So it inadvertently became a way of articulating this concern and opposition to the very regime and challenging them. And following the end of Cold War, actually adopting the European Union environmental run, uh, laws in the run up to the accession was not only great challenge, but also really, really great opportunity and something that helped to improve the protection of environment in, well, they still, we still call it sometimes new member state, but we are around for 20 years. So in uh, the Central European member states. Now, these three studies explore the policy issues in the European origins of the new policy field more in depth. In their presentations, the authors will focus especially on how individual MEPs, political groups, the committees, and the parliament collectively sought to shape agendas and policy responses. Currently, individual MEPs sometimes feel sidelined by the last stage of the legislative process, the trialogue negotiations with the council and the commission. In 70s, when they were not yet directly elected, MEPs could perhaps be more entrepreneurial in developing new agendas. As they still had dual mandates and were primarily national parliamentarians, moreover, working with national level stakeholders was possibly easier than now when we all spend far more time in Brussels and Strasbourg. And national part uh, po political parties sometimes contest and do not always support parliament's strong role in EU legislation. In any case, we can look forward to hearing more 
about how European Parliament sought to shape European community policy making in the three fields in times when it only had consultative and not legislative co-decision making powers. To know more about contentious issues, achievements, and perhaps also failures of the European Parliament, political activism in the past can arguably help us to learn from current and future for current and future challenges. Lastly, I understand that the authors have produced the three studies in a collaborative process, including four workshops across one year of research and writing. This process included one workshop with academic discussions, another with the EPRS staff who work on the same policy fields now. As a result, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the project participants for the valuable contributions to that, to what in a sense has been a, a collective effort. And with this, let me hand over to Wolfram Kaiser, the head of European Parliament's history in the APRS, who will now moderate the event. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President Hoysik, uh, for being with us today and also for this conceptual introduction and also for linking uh, the topics so well, I think, to your own personal and professional preoccupations and your background from Slovakia. So I will introduce now Mechtel Droz, who is the first speaker. Mechtel Droz is a lecturer in comparative politics at the University of Augsburg in Germany. She obtained her PhD in 2018 from the University of Luxembourg's Institute of Political Science. Alongside her main research projects on European social policies, she focuses on the informal dimension of EU politics, especially in times of poly crisis, on the activism of EU supranational institutions, and on the evolution of a European social dimension. Mechtel Droz uh, is the author of the study on the European Parliament and the origins of European social policy, and this is what she's going to talk about in the next 15 minutes. But before I uh, pass the floor to you, Mechtel, I would just like to say to all participants that you're welcome to uh, contribute observations or put questions into the chat. So please use the chat function for that. And after the presentations, we then have about 30 minutes for questions and answers. Mechtel. Thank you very much um, for both the kind introductions. Um, and I'm going to straight away take you back to the 1970s, to the long, long 1970s, so starting in the late 1960s. Um, and that, of course, is a time of subsiding growth in Western Europe. So until the late 1960s, we have the Trente Glorieuse, we have the post-war years of, of economic bloom, um, and of course, the beginnings of the European communities. But now, in the 1970s, things changed. Um, we have subsiding growth, we have intensifying globalization, we have several economic and financial crises that unfolded, not least following, of course, the collapse of the Bretton Woods system and the oil shock. And at the same time, uh, this decade was a decade of social unrest with the 1968 student unrests um, and protests and with the so-called second wave feminism, that is women seeking equality, not only on the labor market, but more generally in terms of gender issues. So it's a it's a very intense decade. It's a decade of disruption, of strain and of change. And in this decade, members of the early European Parliament um, were provided with fertile ground for the pursuit of a deepened and widened social dimension to the European community. Um, the MEPs at the time expected that an extended community social policy would make the community future-proof, in a sense, by strengthening its connection to its citizens. At the same time, these early MEPs hoped that their social political activism would cement Parliament's position as representative of the people in community politics, especially but not only in view of the upcoming first direct elections in 1979. Um, it should be noted, of course, that the importance which MEPs accorded to social policy at the time was not entirely new. Uh, MEPs had pursued social political integration for similar reasons since the first European community's establishment in the 1950s, even though this was, of course, in a different context and with a different and less developed parliamentary institution as such, um, to which I will say more in a minute. However, the 1970s were not only years of global economic change, of, of institutional change, they were really also years of the EP's professionalization as something that became increasingly comparable to a legislative. Um, having started as little more than a consultative assembly in the 1950s, with virtually no competences in the area of social policy, um, the early MEPs um, weren't really supposed to be involved in social policy at the time formally. 
all three of the founding treaties of the European communities saw as main representative of the people and especially of the working people who were a target group of social policy at the time at community level. Um, so the, the, the main institution there, the main representative of these people was the Economic and Social Committee. It wasn't the European Parliament. This, however, did not stop MEPs from trying to influence social policy via a range of strategies uh, that they developed. And when we look at these strategies, it cannot be stressed too much that they were not provided by the treaties. They may sound, when I um, talk about them in a second, they may sound somewhat um, evident for parliamentarians, but they really weren't. The treaties did not provide for a parliament in the sense of a legislative, um, but only of an assembly. Rather, as the late German Social Democrat Horst Seefeld so aptly summarized, we, the early MEPs, parliamentarized parliament. So this is something to keep uh, in mind when we look at these different strategies that MEPs developed to influence uh, the area of social policy um, in the 1970s and onwards. When we look at these strategies, we may look at them in terms of um, parliamentary powers or parliamentary, parliamentary modes of influence that we can also trace um, in other forms, national forms or subnational forms of legislatives, and that we can also trace in the European Parliament. And this would first and foremost, of course, be legislative power or at the time for the European Parliament, legislative influence. The most obvious way to um, exert such influence was via formal consultation. Um, this, of course, provided the EP with uh, much visibility in terms of what it was doing, um, with an openly a public method of showing we are representing the interests of the people, we are trying to achieve better living and working conditions by introducing certain amendments uh, into formal proposals by the European Commission. However, again, there were very few of that kind in the area of social policy because the communities didn't have a proper comprehensive European social uh, policy, social dimension. So what became more important in terms of legislative influence were interinstitutional contacts via which MEPs could exert influence um, and impact on commissioners, on commission members to bring forth certain proposals, um, to adapt their proposals in ways that they would include social aspects, even if they weren't supposed um, to focus on social policy in the first place. Um, and so to use interinstitutional contacts, even though they were invisible in a sense publicly, um, to influence legislative projects. Um, what was very advantageous for MEPs at the time was their and their staffs, very importantly, legal and procedural expertise. Um, even though they had double mandates and were hence also very much busy in their home parliaments, they developed a, a significant level of expertise of ongoing projects, of path dependencies, legislative path dependencies that they could um, exploit in order to present solutions to problems that were existing at the time that the treaties hadn't provided for in terms of crises, in terms of yeah the, the oil shock, etc., unemployment, gender issues, etc. Um, the MEPs had developed expertise in these areas through their home constituencies and through their time in the European Parliament that allowed them to strategically become um, an impactful player because they presented viable solutions. Um, and because they could pr pr present added value for legislative projects that the Commission especially was pursuing at the time. As another typical parliamentary power, um, we have the area of budgetary power, in which, of course, the European Parliament gained a lot in the 1970s through the two budget treaties. Um, this was also very relevant for the area of social policy, because those MEPs um, involved in the area were quite good at linking social policy issues, social policy debates and proposals to budgetary debates by putting a price tag on social policy debates. The European Parliament gained a competence that it wasn't formally supposed to hold. And so they could, uh, these MEPs could really uh, build on the budgetary power that the European Parliament had gained um, in the period of the 1970s. They could also converse budget related procedures, not just in terms of debates and in terms of um, co-decision power, but also when it comes to the um, to the procedure of stopping the budget um, in case of a major disagreement between Council and, and European Parliament. And um, there were even cases in social policy where MEPs threatened to do so unless the Council would agree to extend social policy issues within the budget 
um, or to take into account what MEPs were arguing um, in this area. So budgetary power provided MEPs with additional um, possibilities to pursue their social political games, uh, aims. Sorry. When it comes to the power of initiative or of agenda setting, of course, the European Parliament was utterly limited as um, it remains to some extent until today, in the sense that it could not propose any legislative acts. However, they could, uh, MEPs could already at the time present own initiative reports, they could uh, ask parliamentary questions, written or oral, um, and in this way attempt to um, yeah, have an influence on community agenda setting, which worked quite sometimes in the area of social policy. Obviously, more often than not, it didn't. But we have a few cases, for example, in the area of gender equality, equal pay, equal labor conditions, um, but also when it comes to protection and to special support schemes for particularly vulnerable groups of citizens, um, MEPs could here make visible needs for intervention, possibilities for the community to get involved and to provide minimum standards in the area of social policy. So this also became an area where MEPs achieved some influence, some initiative influence, although we cannot really speak of a proper parliamentary power at the time. Um, MEPs also used the area of social policy in terms of outreach, so they um, sought to undertake study trips in um, particularly concerned regions with people who were in particular need of social support or who were um, yeah, particularly facing particularly dire circumstances. Um, and so MEPs would go there and would present themselves, would not only gather information, but would make sure that they would be perceived as the voice of the people in a sense. Um, they were also having their group meetings and committees, uh, committee meetings, not just in Luxembourg, Brussels and Strasbourg, but across all member states to make sure that people would see them and would see them work in their favour. Um, they would contact media, um, especially towards 1979, so we don't see this so very much before the first direct elections, but in the context of the direct elections, this increased quite a lot that MEPs would uh, actively pursue media coverage. Um, also on social policy issues, again, to make the community palpable, to make it tangible in a way for, for its citizens and to make the community relevant um, for the citizens in very everyday life, really. Um, <clears throat> So yes, in, in this sense, outreach became very important in the pursuit of social policy aims because, again, it had such a symbolic function of making the European Parliament the representative of the, of, of the people. And on this basis of institutional, albeit, albeit often informal power gains and of professionalization, but again, also in the context of global social, uh, social economic change and crisis, MEPs got in the 1970s various opportunities to promote social action in light of unexpectedly emerging needs for social political intervention. And importantly, at this point, they had already um, achieved and had developed an institutional and political toolbox to grasp these different opportunities. Um, but whereas the 1970s thus had an impact on, on the professionalization of the parliamentarization of the European Parliament, it also really had some internal institutional repercussions um, as part of the parliamentarization process, namely in social policy, uh, the EP's new budgetary powers led to an increase in controversy between parliamentary committees. On the one side, we have all the committees primarily involved in social policy who supported more integration in the field. So these were the committees on employment and social affairs, the, uh, on cultural affairs and youth and on political affairs, all of which tended to promote ambitious, far reaching objectives of more community social intervention, increasing competences, better minimum standards, etc. In contrast, we have on the other side, the Committee on Budgets, which tended to insist much more strongly on calling only for what could realistically be implemented at the time with the available funding. So the members of this committee of the Budget Committee aimed at making sure that the EP's new budgetary muscle wasn't overstretched, which might have put at risk the EP standing vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis other institutions involved in community budgetary procedures. So while we have this increasing inter-committee controversy, there was not very much inter-party group controversy at the time when it comes to social policy. This is because those MEPs involved in the area largely strove for similar aims. One reason is that, given the limited competences of the community in social policy, much remained to be gained in the first place. So MEPs often demanded the introduction of minimum standards on which all across ideological um, parties and the ideological spectrum could agree um, without too much controversy. 
Moreover, at that time, political competition took place in the national parties and national parliaments rather than the, in the European Parliament. We also have a strong self-selection process of MEPs at the time who would um, bother taking up the double mandate. Um, so most among them have, were fairly convinced of closer integration, including in the area of social policy. So at this time, MPs didn't really prioritize achieving political victories over other groups. Rather, they sought to gather as much political and, and institutional strength as possible in order both to reach common social political aims and to strengthen their institution's position within EP, uh, EC politics um, as a whole. To conclude, the 1970s constitute a phase in which the European Parliament acquired and consolidated the necessary expertise, the strategic positioning, and also the institutional self-confidence that was necessary, in a sense, for quite remarkably successful social political activism. Even in the long term, we see a recent example of very similar uh, social political activism of the European Parliament um, in the EP's involvement in the European Pillar of Social Rights, which is quite similar to what was going on in the 1970s. Um, and even though European parliamentary positions on social policy did not always or indeed much of the time become community law immediately, they often contributed to shaping the path European social policy would take in the long run. We find examples in the EU's rules on maternity protection, which the EP pursue, uh, pursued since the 1960s, on the European Health Insurance Card, which the EP first proposed in the 1950s, and on a wide range of minimum standards when it comes to gender equality, working conditions, the protection of particularly vulnerable members of society, etc. So the activist skills and ability to act as long-term norm and agenda setter in social policy may well be this main enduring legacy of the European Parliament's involvement in community social policy during the 1970s. Without this early parliamentary activism, today's European social dimension might very likely be less concrete, less tangible and less binding. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mikkel Roos, for this excellent presentation. And we'll now move on straight away to the second presentation, which is also, of course, based on the second study about the European Parliament and the origins of consumer policy. Here, uh, I'm going to introduce Lisbeth van der Rift, who is Professor of International History and of the Environment at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She is a specialist in the history of, Europe, of political representation through the lens of rural and environmental governance in the 20th century. Her main research project titled Consumers on the March studies the role of public interest groups and bottom-up mobilization in the history of European governance. And she has co-authored uh, this study with Kuhn van Zorn, who is also with us today and who will join us in the question and answer session. Kuhn is a postdoctoral researcher at Studio Europa Maastricht. He obtained his PhD from Radboud University in Nijmegen and worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Utrecht University. His research evolves around the relation between Brussels and citizens, the tension between democracy and technocracy in the EU and the EU's commitment to the protection of consumers and the environment. Lisbeth, over to you. Thank you, Wolfram. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I have one more uh, remark to add to these uh, to these words, which is that the study has also benefited from the findings generated by the third researcher in our team in the research uh, uh, project that Wolfram uh, mentioned, and that is Alessandra Schimmel. Um, so first, it is important to say that over the first decades of European integration, the community's rudimentary consumer policy was really based on the premise that market integration itself would automatically benefit consumers, offering them more choice at affordable prices. Starting in the 1960s, but particularly in the long 1970s, community institutions, including the European Parliament, pushed for more elaborate consumer protection measures to safeguard the health, the safety and the economic interests of consumers. Now, what we show in this study is how the European Parliament became the epicenter of debates on consumer affairs, affairs, which largely revolved around the tension between innovation on the one hand and precaution on the other hand. MEPs from the political left, often female, prioritized the protection of consumer health and safety over economic interests of producers and industry. Those on the political center and right adhered to the community's dominant market logic 
that consumers would automatically reap the benefits of innovation and market integration. Advocates of precaution therefore often fail to make consumer protection into a salient political theme. Only when crises or scandals undermine public trust in the safety of food, of medicines, of cosmetics or other products, the parliament could unite behind a precautionary approach and make its mark on community consumer policy. As such, the parliament has shaped debates about consumer protection in Europe that continue to this day. Now, I will briefly talk about first about the one case that we address in our study where this becomes particularly manifest in the harmonization of consumer goods, including foodstuffs and cosmetics. In our briefing, which was published last week, we described this case in more detail. In our extended study, we also analyze another case, namely the regulation of product liability in the European Union. And I will um, come back to that topic later on in the presentation. Now, the harmonization of consumer goods was often a painstaking and highly technical process. From its start in the 1970s, the Parliament recognized the importance of the harmonization of these goods to European citizens, but it also struggled to find a role for itself. Members of Parliament, seeing themselves as politicians rather than technical experts, had to find a way to make this very technical subject political. These were often, as I said, female MEPs from the left of the political spectrum. By advocating high standards of health, safety and quality, the Parliament could show that it represented citizens of the community and consumers on the common market and that it took their concerns seriously. Now, the constant flurry of directives on foodstuffs were highly technical, as I said, and trivial. Members of Parliament sometimes worried about what citizens might think when they would see the Parliament's agenda, where substances and additives in jam and jellies were discussed. And compared with the industry, their knowledge of the science and technology of production was limited. Moreover, MEPs struggled with the highly fragmented nature of consumer policies, with directives regulating specific product groups and the use of particular substances. Now, this sectoral approach complicated their ambition to plea for a more horizontal approach, which would lay down general principles on product safety that it would apply to the entire common market. Principles that would prioritize health and safety over economic interests. Now, mediatized public health crises proved an exception. Members of Parliament could use these to politicize consumer issues and to show their broader socio-political relevance. Our study discusses the Talc de Morange scandal, which took place in France in 1972. A batch of talcum powder for infants was accidentally contaminated with the powerful antibacterial agent hexachlorophene. The error left 36 children dead and eight crippled for life. Just at that time, the European Commission was finishing drafting a directive for cos cosmetic products. As it turned out, the cosmetics industry had had a hand in its formulation, making sure that the directive aligned very well with its own interests. But the accident, the scandal, changed political dynamics. Under public pressure, the directive turned into a battleground for the protection of consumers on the common market. Eventually, the European Parliament managed to overhaul the underlying principle of the regulation of substances. From a negative list system, listing substances which were not allowed, to a positive list system, listing substances whose safety was proven and uncontested. Now, this case shows that the European Parliament, and particularly the Committee on Environment, Public Health and Consumer Protection, so the predecessor of the present ENVI Committee, developed into a remarkably consistent advocate of precaution over the generous authorization of additives. But it severely struggled to get the political significance of these questions across. It would take until the 1990s, when the BSE scandal undermined consumer confidence, for the European Parliament to unite behind the principle of precaution. And even today, the renewed approval of glyphosate and the recent withdrawal by the President of the Commission of the plan to reduce pesticide use by 50% raises doubts about the political weight, the political importance ascribed to the precautionary principle, especially in the context of upcoming elections. 
On a more positive note, our study shows that in moments of crisis, when the European Parliament was able to pick up citizens' concerns and show the political relevance of seemingly technical issues, it could really make its mark, even in a period, the long 1970s, when its formal powers were limited. Now on to our second case, the Directive on Product Liability. This is also rather uh, technical, it shows another side of the Parliament's role in consumer policy. In this case, the Parliament emerges as a supporter of producer interests. In the 1970s, the adverse effects of the unprecedented boom in consumption became increasingly manifest and consumers became dependent on authorities to guarantee the quality and safety of the products and the goods that they consumed and used on a daily basis. Member States adopted consumer legislation to this end and also on the European level, a more comprehensive consumer program was considered desirable. The Directive on Product Liability, which placed responsible for damage caused by faulty products on the shoulders of producers, and this was something new because it had been on the shoulders of consumers before, it was by many considered the litmus test of how genuine the Commission's ambitions regarding consumer protection were. So both consumer organizations as well as producers were eagerly watching developments in Brussels. Now, without going into too much detail here, here it is enough, I think, to state that those forces within the European Parliament that sided with agricultural producers and with the industry in the end proved stronger than those fighting for stricter, stricter consumer protection rules. Division within the Parliament caused a major delay. Moreover, the European Parliament sought to water down the Commission's directive. Ultimately, however, the Commission itself proved of crucial importance to the further development of consumer policy when it decided to go against the wishes of the European Parliament. And this was actually something that it did not really want to do, but it felt it was important in this case. A closer look does reveal deep divisions within the European Parliament, between political groups and also within parliamentary committees. It lays bare an image of the Parliament, not as a monolithic actor, but as one deeply divided. By the way, along similar lines, the Commission itself was divided on this issue too. And Commission President Roy Jenkins, in the end, decided in favor of stricter consumer protection rules. Discussion within the Parliament, discussions within the Parliament were shaped and also colored by the parliamentary committee assigned to report on the directive. So our study also shows this, uh, the political significance of the division of uh, um, parliamentary committee work. Debates about the product liability directive show that the predominance of a discourse centered around the functioning, the logic of the common market. So that was the angle of the legal affairs committee, which was assigned to report on this directive, uh, that that was a predominant discourse. The position of consumers, on the other hand, and also the arguments of the ENFI committee received much less attention. Concluding, um, our study shows, first of all, uh, many things, uh, so I would recommend to uh, to read it once the full version is published, uh, but just some observations, which is that I think the history of the, the development of consumer policy and also more generally, I guess, the history of European integration shows the markedly different conceptualization of the consumer that political actors brought forward and also sought to impose citizens, uh, consumers as a market citizen, so as someone benefiting automatically from market integration, but also as a consumer citizen with rights and duties, the vulnerable citizen in need of protection and uh, regulation. What also stands out is the important role that consumer organizations played. And um, in our research, we have focused primarily on the uh, Bureau of European Consumer Unions, BUC, um, the archives of which are located in, in Florence at the European, at the historical archives of the European Union uh, since recently. Now, this umbrella organization had been organized in Brussels since 1962, and it held clo close relations with the ENVI committee and also with consumer friendly officials in the commission. In this context, the accession of 
Denmark and the United Kingdom, the, and their entry into the European community cannot be underestimated. These were two countries with strong consumer movements and traditions of consumer representation. And that was definitely a factor of influence to explaining um, the uh, political significance ascribed to consumer um, protection in the long 1970s. And last, our study shows the importance of the media and of media mediatization of public health um, scandals, which could serve as a catalyst for consumer protection regulation. Um, and our research project shows that it was never the only reason, but often there were already processes and procedures underway, and definitely such a scandal could help to, as I said, to accelerate and to, uh, to serve as a catalyst. Um, all in all, the European Parliament stands out as an early advocate of the precautionary principle and as one that at times managed to play a decisive role in the development of consumer policies in the European community in the 19, long 1970s. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisbeth, for this excellent presentation and for providing also insights into internal divisions within the European Parliament, uh, we'll probably, and also linking this to present-day issues. Uh, similar internal divisions, of course, persist uh, nowadays. And the same is probably true for the next policy field that we're going to look into, which is the environment, as the recent uh, protests by farmers against environmental regulation imposing costs on them have perhaps illustrated quite well. Uh, we are moving on to Jan-Henrik Meyer now. Jan-Henrik Meyer is researcher at Max Planck Institute for Legal History and Legal Theory in Frankfurt am Main in Germany. He combines an interest in the history, politics and law of European integration with environmental history. His current research traces the emergence of environmental law from its inception in the early 1970s until the 1990s. And Jan-Henrik is the author of the forthcoming study on the European Parliament and the origins of environmental policy. Jan-Henrik. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and um, I'm glad to have an audience that's so interested in these issues. Um, so the key question underlying my study is really why is there an environmental uh, policy in the European Union and what was the role and the contribution that the European Parliament played in this? And um, for that, like Mechthild, I need to take you back to uh, the late 1960s, the early 1970s, when this all started. Um, at that time, there was a growing awareness for the sort of negative side effects of growing prosperity, of, of rapid economic growth. Rivers were increasingly polluted, the air was polluted, as Vice President Heusig mentioned for uh, Eastern Europe, that was also already the case in Western Europe at that time too. Um, that fish in rivers really alerted people to uh, realize that there was actually a price to pay for that rapid growth. Um, this contributed to uh, public debates in the media. Uh, there were also books published uh, on these issues. Um, research was conducted, researchers collaborated increasingly internationally at the time. And international organizations fostered this uh, research. They um, started uh, events like the European Conversation Year, Conservation Year uh, in 1970, um, as uh, brought together experts um, to discuss environmental issues. Um, that was organized by the Council of Europe, which was actually responsible for these issues, um, and it's very interesting how the European communities uh, sort of replaced the, the Council of Europe in this respect. Um, as in um, the case of consumer protection, scandals played an important role. Uh, what um, raised awareness for environmental issues was uh, were major oil spills that uh, created horrible images of birds covered with oil. Um, and um, one of the scandals that happened in 1969 um, was very instrumental for, uh, for um, European Parliament members to actually place the environment on the EC agenda. 
um, in the summer of 69, which was a very hot and dry summer, there was a major fish kill in the Rhine River with dead fish uh, floating down the river. The German authorities uh, over the weekends neglected to inform the Dutch and um, these fish arrived and created a lot of <clears throat> a lot of concern in the Netherlands, which heavily relied on Rhine water for drinking, for agriculture, uh, for all sorts of purposes. <clears throat> and thus it was Dutch members of the European Parliament from um, the Committee on Public Health and Social Affairs, the same committee that um, um, at the time that we all refer to, um, and they um, placed this on the agenda in debates on pesticide residues that were discussed at the time anyway, and they argued that this was a cross-border environmental problem and thus it was necessary to address this at the European level. Um, the um, committee then opted for uh, an own initiative report <clears throat> that was the only instrument or the major instrument that the members of the European Parliament had at the time to place issues on the agenda. That also included uh, references to the possible legal basis for action because that was very relevant. Um, you can only make legislation if you have um, the competences. And uh, once they had submitted this report, they backed this up with questions and pushed the Commission uh, to actually act. And um, when, um, um, and in 1971, then finally, the European Commission started to, to pick up um, this issue and started to work on drafting an environmental action program, which also had to do, and that was something that it's not all from only from the parliament, but it happens in a context where also at the national level, member states um, established their own national policies on the environment and that created comp uh, competition issues. And these competition issues then convinced the governments to act collectively at the European level uh, in order to avoid distortions in the market. I'm in the study, I'm illustrating this on the emergence of the action program, but today I want to focus, as is in the briefing, also on the issue of how the members of the European Parliament also in, were strongly involved in shaping the contents of the policy, namely uh, on a very unconventional, very unexpected environmental issue, namely birds protection, transnational birds protection, the protection of migratory birds. Bird protection is a very old issue in environmental um, protection. Already in the, at the turn of the 19th century, there were groups, um, there was legislation to protect birds useful for agriculture. There was um, one of the oldest environmental groups, nature conservation groups, are um, bird protection groups. Um, and it, at that time, a shift happened in the early 20th century, a shift happened between those countries where eating and hunting small birds became a taboo that happened in the north of Europe, whereas in the south of Europe, in Belgium, France, Italy, this continued and it was uh, celebrated as one of these rights that um, laboring men had to actually hunt um, to uh, a hard one right from the French Revolution in France. <clears throat> um, the hunting of birds was also a, a concern that was strongly related to agriculture. The agricultural commissioner um, criticized this very uh, strongly, Zico Mansold, who um, also related this to the issue of pesticides of DDT. He argued that if you have, um, if you hunt birds, then there are more birds, uh, there are less birds, fewer birds, and more insects, and thus you need more DDT. And that harks back to larger debates, um, international debates, Rachel Carson's critique of the use of DDT and um, the ban on DDT, one of the strongest, first and strong pesticide ban in the early 1970s. Um, how, where, how did this issue arrive at the European Parliament? It arrived from the media, but also from civil society, namely from uh, environmental groups that argued that there was a looming catastrophe in the ecological system. 
and that birds needed to be protected across borders and um, they uh, submitted um, petitions to uh, the European Parliament. Initially, um, already in the 1960s and 67, um, um, members of the European Parliament posed questions to the Commission and the Commission said no in 67, uh, this is none of our business, this is stuff that the Council of Europe deals with. But in the context of the emerging environmental policy in the early 1970s, the Commission changed its opinion and um, the um, and mem uh, members of the European Parliament pushed with letters um, uh, with with questions for the Commission to include this in the Environmental Action Program. But they only the Commission only promised to undertake a study and to ask the member states to join uh, international organisations and international conventions. This was not enough for. Uh, the Environmental Committee and um, the member, um, particularly for a German Christian Democratic member of the European Parliament, uh, Hans Edgar Jahn, who uh, co started collaborating and responding to one of these petitions and submitted an own initiative report on bird protection, on the protection, on the need to have European legislation to protect migratory birds. That was actually, and that I could trace in the uh, European Parliament's archives. Um, had major resonance across um, the media of all members that this is something that was reported upon at a time when there was very little reporting on the European Parliament across all member states. And um, from then on, members, uh, the members of the European Parliament continued pushing. The Commission actually submitted uh, a legislative proposal and um, the European Parliament's members also continued uh, to cooperate with NGOs for joint campaigns um, to push that for legislation and thus they managed to persuade the member states to actually um, to actually uh, have legislation which was very controversial because in some member states in, in Italy and France and members of the European Parliament from those countries said this is this will be legislation that will be very hard to implement this is something that people won't accept and thus we shouldn't have such legislation uh, listen to what the our government says this is this is actually uh, for real uh, nevertheless there was an uh, an overwhelming majority in the parliament that thought that such kind of legislation was very necessary and in the end uh, governments agreed on this after some compromising. Um, so how can we see, um, uh, how can we tell how the European um, parliament um, tried to persuade um, and to act and advance policy? Um, we can characterize the European parliament as and its members as policy entrepreneurs who were particularly strong in agenda setting. Um, they observed public debates, they framed um, uh, debates in the parliament uh, according um, li linking um, issues and framing them as international ones, as ones that are related to uh, treaty bases. And they built networks and uh, they were very, very persistent. They've learned from uh, Roman Senator Cato, and they've placed it again and on the agenda again and again repeatedly. And this is this was a very successful strategy. Um, um, who are who in the European Parliament advanced such issues? Uh, it's uh, the committees, and also here we can see differences between committees. The Economic Committee, for example, takes the position that. Um, um, for example, in water pollution, the sea is the best place to dump everything and it's most efficient to actually um, have, use the natural powers of the sea to dilute, whereas uh, the Environmental and the Social Health Committee were very different opinions. Um, the controversy between party groups was not so strong at that time when um, the environment was a new issue and not as politically as divisive as today. Um, what also mattered were uh, networks across um, 
the between members of the European Parliament with NGOs um, link uh, jointly linking protest um, and um, thus being able to impress member states to actually enact legislation. Cooperation with the media was more difficult. There is some evidence, but um, at the time when you had one or two TV channels, it was near impossible for members of the European Parliament to actually get on television. That's very different from today. Um, what I'm arguing here in the study and what's more explicit in the larger study is really um, that the study shows that through these different strategies applied by the members of the European Parliament, applied by committees, um, the formerly powerless European Parliament made an important impact on the emergence of environmentality, on its contents, on its scope, um, and thus made a real difference. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jan Henrik Meyer. We now have about 30 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, and I have uh, three questions or contributions so far. Uh, Etienne Basso, our director of the member service, would like to pose a question or add some comments and observations first, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfram, and thank you very much uh, to the very interesting presentations. Uh, you mentioned three policy areas and, and the emergence, uh, the evolution. Um, um, I think there are a lot of similar similarities between these different policy areas, but, but also different tracks, if you like, in the in the evolution. And I would like to come back to something that Meshtil mentioned in, in her intervention. She said that in the early days of um, of social policy, uh, the importance of budgetary power and how budgetary power was used as a leverage uh, to reach other things, if you like, by the members of parliament. And I would like to ask you, I mean, one of the three of you about the relations between budgetary and legislative powers. My impression is that uh, budgetary powers was more important at the time we are talking about, uh, it has been taken over, if you like, by a regulatory power after a co-decision has become sort of mainstream. But I would be interested to have your views on the relation between these two major uh, powers of the parliament um, throughout the lens of these three particular policy fields. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. I think this is a very important question. Unfortunately, there's very little systematic historical research about the budgetary powers of the European Parliament or generally about the budget in European integration, which is perhaps because it's a very political, but also very technical issue. Uh, for the benefit of everyone, we should perhaps say that the Parliament acquired these budgetary powers first in the Luxembourg Treaty of 1970 and then in the Brussels Treaty, they were extended of 1975. And initially, of course, they were mainly for the non-obligatory spending, which in the very beginning was only 3% of community spending, but then by the early 1980s, I think in the region of 25% or so of the overall budget. Um, we have one participant who is a former chair of the Committee on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection, Malcolm Harbour, uh, at that time in the period 2004 to 2009, a conservative British member of the European Parliament. Uh, Malcolm, um, you could uh, unmute yourself, or you have been unmuted probably, and if you could switch on the camera, then it would be possible for you to add some observations yeah. yourself directly. Thank you for joining us. Uh, well, it's a, a real pleasure, and um, thank you for inviting me. Well, I, I obviously particularly focused on the uh, consumer presentation, which I found fascinating. Uh, but, but what particularly interested me was how so many of the earlier issues uh, continued right through up until my time in the European Parliament. And um, it's worth noting that consumer protection itself um, always seemed to be as a policy rather an orphan policy. Um, and it was tacked on to the Environment uh, Committee for some time. But I think rightly so, the Parliament felt that it didn't have enough uh, uh, enough prominence there and also the environment committee as we just heard from the last presentation has so many other areas to cover um, and so it, i think what is not uh, generally noted really is that consumer protection then finally became more recognized in the parliament in 1999 when i joined and i became a member of the internal market and consumer protection committee which was then a newly formed committee um, and it was interesting 
uh, that our speaker talked also about the, the role of British MEPs and their interest in consumer policy. The first chairman of that committee was Philip Whitehead, uh, who sadly died in office, but he was a really prominent consumer campaigner from the United Kingdom. Uh, so from the start, the committee had uh, a strong consumer focus. And I used to find people came to me and said, well, why have you got an internal market and consumer protection together? And I said, well, actually, this is really critical for consumers. Uh, because as your study pointed out, um, there were lots of issues about um, uh, the quality of products, safety of products, environmental performance of products, uh, w which needed to be addressed by uh, internal market rules, essentially. So that was my first point uh, to say that um, I think what would be interesting to look at will be to see the influence of that newly formed committee. Now, I'm obviously biased about that because I chaired it for five years, but I would say during that time, my time was occupied almost equally between the two portfolios. Uh, I spent a lot of time with the consumers organizations. We passed the consumer rights uh, directive during that time. Uh, and I think that we demonstrated very much the importance of, uh, of consumer policy in that respect. So my closing point is that, of course, we weren't necessarily or helped the process or by the whole process uh, is that the European Commission has only ever had one dedicated commissioner for consumer protection. And that was there basically by a historical accident of enlargement because when Mrs. Megalina Kunova, who many of you may know, uh, became the first Romanian commissioner. Uh, they were short of, um, of, uh, of portfolios to give the new incoming commissioners because they came in halfway through the commission cycle. So she became the first consumer commissioner. And I have to say she was most effective. I mean, I remember there was an issue about Chinese uh, uh, safety of toys and she was on a plane to China together with, the direct, with Gunther Verheugen from the internal market to sort this out. Uh, and so, I mean, I think there are much broader issues about how consumers were represented. And I think the Parliament's uh, contribution has been disproportionately high in the range of policies that it works on uh, because there was a bit of a lacuna in the Commission. And we called in my committee at that time for a European, a European Union consumer policy because responsibility was divided between the Commissioner for Legal Affairs, Mrs. Redding, and the Commissioner for Health, Commissioner Daly. And we finally got them together. And interestingly, they came to my committee to present the consumer policy strategy for the Commission, the two of them together, which shows how Parliament can really, at that time, was really influencing events in consumer policy. So I've enjoyed participating so far and a really good. I'm really pleased the PRS is doing a bit more work on history, but perhaps they could start to work uh, during my time of history, because I did think we made a bit of history during that period. Thank you very much. We have to start somewhere. So this is in the origins of these policy areas in the 1970s. I have one more question or comment in the chat, which I would like to read out, which is addressed to all three uh, presenters. My question would be, this is from Vitus Terville, who uh, was a PhD researcher at the University of Salzburg. What were the main obstacles MEPs had to overcome to exercise influence? Were there any failed initiatives more broadly? What were the roads not taken? So with these three uh, comments and questions put together, I would uh, suggest that Lisbeth and uh, Kuhn perhaps start, because there was also this special uh, comment by Malcolm Harper addressed uh, specifically in the direction of the um, con of consumer protection. Um, and then uh, perhaps uh, we inverse the order, so Jan Henrik and then Mechtild at the end. Yes, thank you everyone for your uh, interesting and stimulating questions and comments. Um, maybe to uh, address uh, the questions of Malcolm Harbour first, um, because they related directly to our study. Yes, I think uh, the the uh, description of an orphan policy <laughs> is uh, is quite apt when it comes to consumer uh, protection. Uh, as we say in our study, it was originally grouped with environmental policy, with environmental policy often being the more sort of prominent uh, issue. Also, when it came for uh, to MEPs wanting to further their political careers, for example. 
it's not for nothing that in this period, as we describe also, um, that it was still a highly gendered issue where it was mainly female MEPs who were active on this subject and therefore maybe also because it was considered uh, an issue that concerned with the daily issues of house housewives, uh, that it wasn't taken fully uh, seriously. But this, of course, uh, changed over time and uh, it's good that you also mentioned uh, the, the, the later period, the 1990s, when it was subsumed under the uh, Internal Market Committee. Um, and this is really a constant that we've seen in our study, that there is a constant struggle over the, say, internal struggle within the, uh, the European Parliament as well about the, the, the governance, the, um, how the committees are organized and where consumer policy then um, belongs. Um, and, and of course, it, in that it was also looking to what happened was happening in the European Commission, but it's also important to emphasize that even before the European Commission was active uh, on consumer protection policy that the European Parliament was already pushing uh, for, uh, especially the, the, the socialist group, uh, was already pushing for um, consumer protection measures so that it was also active uh, in the absence of uh, anything happen, uh, happening at the commission level. Um, then on to the, the question about uh, budgetary power. Um, you right, uh, rightly mentioned uh, Etienne Basso. Um, um, I think in when it comes to consumer policy, the question of regulatory power is more uh, prescient. Um, uh, this didn't often uh, concern budgetary uh, issues and therefore, um, yes, it, it was mainly a question of, of, of market integration and, and this didn't really, um, this is, th yeah, didn't really concern budgetary powers uh, uh, at the time. So in the 1970s, this was uh, not a huge issue for the uh, consumer protection advocates. Um, finally, uh, the question about uh, obstacles, failed initiatives and roads not taken. Um, I think um, without wanting to enter into details about uh, any particular directive, I think overall um, um, the issue of roads not taken and um, failed initiatives, um, it was the difficulty I think uh, in for the European Parliament to even politicize uh, the issue uh, of consumer protection beyond these incidents, incidents, these um, scandals that we talked about, uh, and to really put it on to the agenda of the uh, European Community as a structural issue, a structural problem, um, and to advocate for a more integrated approach to consumer protection instead of having all these uh, fragmented rules on uh, particular product groups. I think that was the main issue, which then, as Markham Halber uh, described, took off in the 1990s, but that was 20 years on, so uh, it took a long time. Thank you very much. Kun. Lisbeth, would you like to add something? Uh, well, maybe Wolfram, you would allow me to also respond to the to the last question that was posed in the chat. Um, oh, sorry, I will ask this separately at the next round, please, if that's okay. Okay, because it yeah. links uh, to the consumer policy one as well. Yeah, but it would still be good if we could have an, another round of questions as well. Okay, in that case, I don't have anything okay. to add. Okay, Henry. Yeah, um, it's. I have a good example because I've I've actually done a case study on a, a on a policy that failed in the mid 1970s in the context of uh, anti-nuclear protest and uh, the feeling among the members of the uh, research uh, committee, uh, research and energy committee of the European Parliament. There was a major initiative that also linked to things the the governments and the Commission were doing, but. Um, that was clearly an own initiative report. Um, the European Parliament proposed um, setting up a procedure for um, 
for um, Europeanizing the planning of nuclear power plants location if they were at national borders. And that was then actually taken up by the Commission for legislation, but in the context of Katnom and, and, and of, of particularly French nuclear power plants at the Belgian and the uh, Luxembourg and German border, uh, this never really uh, uh, was possible. It was never possible to overrule uh, the French uh, national veto at a time when there was uh, uh, unanimity in council. So um, there were many initiatives. There's actually in, in the early 90s, there is um, the European Commission withdraws hundreds and hundreds of proposals, you know, veritable graveyard of proposals that had never really uh, entered, um, had never really been agreed upon. And that, that shows that um, initiatives from all sorts of places never really, um, yeah, never really um, made it. So it's, it, there, there's lots of evidence of things that failed. On that note, make it, you probably have to add something here as well when it comes to social policy. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm, there's so many, so many things. I'll start with that question and then I, I come to the other ones. Um, so roads not taken. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry for the selfie or, but I'm discussing a range of them in my book, Turning Talk into Power, the Parliamentary Roots of European Social Policy, which um, was published with Paul Grave in 21. Um, because the thing is there are way more roads not taken than roads taken when it comes to the European Parliament um, and social policy at the time. But with a but, so what I said in my presentation is very typical for this area. Roads not taken were not taken at the time, but might be taken by the European um, Union, often not even the community, but the Union, uh, years and decades later. And one thing, one point, one issue in the area of social policy that was perceived as a major setback in the European Parliament really was the issue of maternity protection, um, which the Commission tried in the 60s um, on the initiative of the European Parliament and then just shelved. Um, because there was too much opposition from the member states and from the council. And the MEPs tried and tried and tried again and again, well through the 1970s to get this back on the agenda and, and nothing happened. The commission just blocked it entirely. Um, but then it came back and in the 90s it was adopted. Um, and again, what I also said before with the European Health Insurance Card that the, the EP suggested for migrant workers in the 1950s, was something that was shelved very quickly at the time, but came later. So there's there's loads of examples um, of initiatives the EP pursued or MEPs pursued in the area of social policy that just didn't manifest. Um, but it should also be said that in this area of very limited competence, um, a lot was tried where the MEPs were very well aware that there was pretty much no way that this would happen. For instance, in my in my study, I shed light on the on the case of of education on European integration, of educating the citizens on what the communities are and what great added value integration is um, providing, etc. And as part of this um, large endeavor of creating European consciousness, etc., they proposed um, establishing uh, a community Olympics team very seriously in a very supposedly serious format, but obviously they knew that this would never manifest at the time. Um, and so what we see in the area of social policy is really a symbolism, this area being used in a way that the MEPs knew we have very little competence, but we can make bold claims because we want to be seen as speaking up for the citizens. So it's a bit of both, a bit of trying to actually implement or to, to really reach change, um, but also just using their, their freedom to say pretty much whatever they wanted, also because they faced very little sanctions from home. Their national parties were fairly uninterested in what they were doing, uh, disinterested in what they were doing um, at the community level. Um, and so they, they didn't face any sanctions in a way if they were unsuccessful in their social political activism. So this is actually something um, I, I had an interview with uh, Jacques Santerre, who was not only commission president, obviously, but also MEP prior to 1979. And he uh, said that if any MEP had an idea the others felt sounded great, they would just encourage them to put it forward and to put it through the committee and um, 
nothing would happen if it wouldn't be successful because nobody would notice anyway but if it was successful if they managed to get anything through then they could really build on this and expand expand their very limited power at the time to get just a little bit bigger um yeah so maybe that much on on this question then the question by etienne basso very interesting on the on the balance between budgetary and legislative or regulatory power um in the area of social policy there was really the, the treaties, the 1970s budget treaties, were a bombshell um, in changing um, this balance towards budgetary power becoming the non plus ultra of, of parliamentary power. And um, until then, the Budgetary Committee had not had this um, yeah, um, over, over position, super position among the other committees. But with these treaties, that changed a lot. And then the other MEPs really needed to almost come begging to to pursue their what i said their strategy of attaching a price tag to social political activism in order to put it on the budgetary agenda and this is why we have this increasing controversy from the budget treaties on between pretty much all committees other than the budgetary committee pursuing social policy and the budgetary committee as kind of the the even bigger brother <laughs> stopping all the great ideas or really being realistic um, in what was reachable and what was worth arguing for in interinstitutional um, controversies also, of course, because, yeah, not every fight was, was worth fighting between uh, Council Commission and European Parliament. So I would really say that the budget treaties um, made, had a major impact on how the EP also pursued its stronger parliamentarization until the budget treaties, I would argue, it really pursued this via legislative strategies, trying to, to influence legislation more generally. And then really now that they had this budgetary toolbox, this was much more used than it had been previously. Um, okay. And sorry, I haven't yeah. answered too much. Can, you can, if there's something else that you would like to say, maybe in the second round, because I think we have a second round of uh, questions now, it would be good if we could uh, make room for that. Um, there's one from Jonah Berger, who's uh, currently uh, an intern in the European Parliament. Uh, to what extent did internal divisions within the European Parliament prevent it from exercising stronger influence? The presenters made clear that the EP did not act as a unified bloc, but to what extent would it have increased its chances of success if it had? Malcolm Harbour has some additional observations here that on initiatives report, initiative reports were uh, very instrumental and influential. Uh, and also that uh, the impact assessments are further area of expertise. That's a more recent phenomenon. Uh, this didn't exist in the 1970s, impact assessments or the impact that European regulation had on the member states or citizens. Um, and then finally, we have a question from Michelle Egan, who is professor of uh, political science and the specialist of the European Union uh, and law, sorry, the European law, I think, and the specialist of the European Union at American University in Washington. And Michel uh, says, my question is whether there is focus on the role of EP staff and committee staff in particular in drafting legislation, talking with the lobbyists or talking with commission officials. So the role of staff. And uh, I, each of you would now have about three minutes to respond um, at, at your uh, own decision to some of these questions, not to all of them. Perhaps, Mechtel, you can continue now, um, but be selective. I would encourage you to be selective at this stage um, as to what you want to respond to. I'll be brief. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll start with Michelle Egan's um, question on yeah, the role of EP staff, um, which I believe deserves much more much more research um, because it was so crucial, especially in a parliament that was a part-time parliament um, where staff was there all the time and, and members were not. Um, and in the area of social policy, talking with lobbyists virtually played no role as far as I'm aware because the European Parliament was just not the institution to go to if any lobbyists were interested in influencing social policy, they would go to the Economic and Social Committee as the one in, formally, uh, based on the treaties, um, involved in social policy making. But I would say it's almost the same um, when it comes to the role of EP staff in drafting legislation and when it comes to having contacts with um, commission officials, because they would, EP staff would feed 
um, Commission officials or would feed MEPs taking ideas to the European Commission, not so much on entire legislative projects. So this is nothing that I really found in the area of social policy that the EP basically um, fed the European Parliament, uh, the European Commission, sorry, with an entire ready piece of legislation. But they would rather propose sections, propose um, references to the treaties, propose legal expertise on how this area of social policy with very limited um, treaty um, articles on it, and those were very, very vague. So how these few articles could be used in order to get a social dimension of the European communities going. So this is really, yeah, a, a briefing um, commission official, uh, commission officials on the interests of the European Parliament and on strategies that were basically um, pursuing aims that the Parliament as a whole was pursuing. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get the chance to think about Jonah Berger's question. I, uh, you I don't have, have to answer, answer all of them, Mechtel, at this point. Okay, then I'll pass on for the moment. Very sorry, maybe okay. I'll write something. Uh, Jan Henrik, do you have any final uh, remarks? Yeah, um, the, on the European Parliament staff, I uh, really observed. Um, I have, I have uh, archival materials where you have exchanges of letter between the archive, uh, the MEP, uh, the, par, um, the Strasbourg, uh, the, the Luxembourg staff, uh, and the MEP. And there, uh, the, the staff is very important in writing summary documents in. And they, they are actually taking sides and they are um, they are supporting, they are closely aligning with the um with the um uh, with the MEP and uh, helping interpret certain views and they're saying, oh, this is the, the sort of arguments that these kind of people are always making. And um in that and I think the the internal divisions um at the time uh, were not so they, among uh, committees and among European Parliament members were not as big and they were sort of paved over by uh, a widespread view that more European more Europe is better and that um, this the, the strong self-selection in the 19 before 1979 uh, also built certain bridges where um, where um, this this dysfunctional division uh, did not matter so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kuhn, I, I will um, briefly start by responding to the question about the staff of uh, the European Parliament and its parliamentary committees. Um, as historians, we unfortunately have to rely on the materials that are available. So for the uh, for the for the parliamentary committees, unfortunately, we haven't uh, been able to look at sort of documents that allow for uh, for an insight into these um, uh, into these sort of internal dynamics and also the contribution of the staff. Um, it's it's a very good point, uh, and uh, we we did manage to find um, uh, archival material that that gave us a glimpse of the role that uh, staff within the commission played uh, and there we see that uh, officials at different uh, function levels really played an important role in also convincing commissioners to take certain positions over others uh, actually saying for instance you know we need to go for uh, stricter uh, product liability directives because otherwise and this is a quote the consumer organizations will raise a stink uh, so these kinds of uh, these kinds of, of, of quotes are very uh, I think very uh, telling of 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 the um, of the views within the commission, but also the, um, the the contribution that that members of staff are actually able to, and the influence that they exert on uh, on on uh, on um, officials in higher um, positions. Uh, moving, uh, uh, passing on to to Kuhn. Uh Yeah, and um, I might add that. Uh... Especially the consumer organizations uh, increasingly found their way to the European Parliament actually as they realized that it yeah was an important institution in shaping consumer policy. Although then in later on in the 70s they also became somewhat disappointed in in the extent to which the EP was really committed to um, pushing for a more ambitious consumer protection policy and. I guess that ties in with the question about internal divisions, because 
one of the findings of our reports is that one of the reasons why the European Parliament was unable to really act as a as a uh, coherent um, force, agenda setting force on consumer policy at times was also because of internal divisions, not so much along political lines as along the lines of committees. Um, the MV committee at the time was, uh, well, not not uh, the most prestigious and especially when it came to the attribution of reports, um, it was often the legal committee, as, as Lisbeth mentioned, or the internal market committee um, that, um, yeah, that gained the authorship of, of landmark reports and their consumer policy was often not top of mind uh, when it came to uh, to uh, responding to commission uh, initiatives and and that's also where the uh, envy committee really struggled to to uh, yeah uh, push for more ambition yeah thank you very much kuhn uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone uh, here as a historian of course i would like to underline what lise petit says has, has said about the source question so the way in which the european parliament preserves its its own sources makes it a bit difficult to get to uh, the level of staff and their contribution and their role and then we have to rely where available on other types of sources for example in my work on the first of the 1980s and the european parliament's role in institutional reform i found a lot of interesting material in the private papers of Altiero Spinelli, who worked very closely with his four committee staff in developing the draft treaty on European Union. So there it was very clearly reflected, whereas in the formal uh, papers of the European Parliament, in the way in which they have to be preserved according to rules and regulations, uh, that was would have been much less visible. And of course, for more recent periods, we can also interview eyewitnesses and are doing this for the studies that we are working on at the moment, because this was the first experience or three uh, studies, external studies in this case, but um, nevertheless prepared in a process which involved um, a lot of other commentators, discussions, internal stuff from the EPRS across a period of one year. And we're currently work working on a set of five internal and external studies on the role of the European Parliament in the transformative period of the end of the Cold War. So there, of course, it is much easier already to find eyewitnesses that we can still interview about their role and the role of the parliament in different policy areas or policy challenges. Now, with this, I would like to give the floor to Etienne Basso again for some final words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfram, for, for, for the effective moderation. Thank you very much to Mechtil, Lisbeth, Jan Henrik and Kohn. I think we had a very rich uh, presentation today and also good interaction with uh, uh, our listeners online. Just wanted to say on my side that the studies are available online, so I encourage you to download them and to read them. This event will be also available for um, uh, re-listening on YouTube as of uh, tomorrow evening, hopefully, or the day after. We are also, of course, grateful to uh, Vice President Hoysik. He had to, to leave for other commitments at one can uh, imagine. So, uh, just uh, indication on the next events, we will have the 5th of March at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, an event on the 2024 US elections, implications for transatlantic relations. I encourage you to join on WebEx. This is an online event. We'll have an on-site event, the 7th of March, conference on foresight and better lawmaking, legislating for future generation trends and challenges in impact assessment and anticipatory policy making the 7th of March in the afternoon at 2.30 in our library, but also online. And then the presentation of our budgetary outlook 2024, the 21st of March, how to finance EU's priorities for the next legislative term. So uh, again, thank you very much to everyone. I wish you a good day and see you soon. Bye-bye.